Howdy y'all, welcome back. Over a year and a half ago, I made a video on the oldest photographs that I could find of Philadelphia, along with a brief history of that city, according to the modern textbooks. One thing that stood out to me from that video, and something that I often find myself thinking about when the discussion shifts to the world's fairs of our past, is the Centennial Exposition that was held in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1876 to commemorate 100 years or one century since America declared independence. Why this particular exposition stands out to me is due in part to the sheer lack of photographs that I was able to produce for you when I first researched this topic many months ago. Luckily, over this past weekend, my interest was again sparked on the subject of the World's Fairs. I wanted to give a big thank you here to John Levi. If you're unfamiliar with his work, you should definitely take a moment after this video and dive into some of his videos relating to our not so distant past. I decided, seeing as this was a major event in United States history being the World's Fair in Philadelphia, and seeing as photography was well established by the year 1876, I decided to give the Centennial Exposition another look. What I found for you today is what I would consider to be the most detailed collection of photographs from the 1876 World's Fair in Philadelphia that are available online. To locate these images, I first changed the parameters of my search, and once I began looking into stereoscopic or old world 3D photographs, I was able to find an abundant collection of images taken specifically at the 1876 Fair in Philadelphia. Today, we will finally satiate our appetites for photographs from this elusive World's Fair, diving deep into this stereoscope collection while I briefly discuss some of the more interesting aspects of the current narrative as it relates to the 1876 Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. Enjoy, and remember, as we look through these images from the World's Fair of 1876, nearly every single one of the buildings pictured here was meant to be temporary. The 1876 Centennial Exposition was held in what is today Fairmount Park, Philadelphia City, Pennsylvania. This fair is considered to be the first official World's Fair held in the United States. However, the 1876 Centennial Exposition was modeled after the earlier sanitary fairs of the United States, including the Great Sanitary Fair of 1864, which was also held in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That initial sanitary fair raised over $1 million for bandages and medicine during the Civil War. Both the 1864 fair and the 1876 World's Fair were said to be modeled in a neo-Gothic style, which was apparently abundant in Philadelphia at this time. The 1876 fair was said to be the brainchild of John L. Campbell, a professor of mathematics, natural philosophy, and astronomy from Wabash College in Indiana. Remarkably, Mr. Campbell doesn't have much information about his life provided, and yet in the year 1866, Mr. Campbell was said to have reached out to Philadelphia's mayor, suggesting that the United States Centennial be celebrated officially in Philadelphia with a World's Fair. By the year 1870, the Philadelphia City Council approved the fair to be held in 1876. After this, Pennsylvania then created a committee who would lobby Congress, and Congress in return introduced a bill which created the United States Centennial Commission on March the 3rd, 1871. The commission was officially formed and met for the first time exactly one year later on March the 3rd, 1872. To convolute this history further, we're also told the United States Centennial Commission then lobbied Congress again, who subsequently created the Centennial Board of Finance, headed by one John Welsh, a philanthropist whose family had assisted in gathering funds for the 1864 Sanitary Fair in Philadelphia. This Centennial Board was authorized to sell up to $10 million in shares to finance the 1876 exposition. The city of Philadelphia provided over 1.5 million of these dollars, while the state of Pennsylvania provided an additional 1 million. However, 
By the year 1876, with funds still drastically short, the federal government provided an additional $1.5 million to the board. The Centennial Board, apparently facing financial ruin following the fair, attempted to claim that the government loan was actually a subsidy, meaning, essentially, it did not need to be paid back. The federal government immediately sued the Centennial Board in a case that would go on to reach the Supreme Court in which the Centennial Board was forced to repay the government. Along the planning process for the fair, the Fairmount Park Commission, another commission that was founded in Philadelphia, was charged with setting aside over 450 acres of Fairmount Park for this exposition, which was officially donated and dedicated on July the 4th, 1873. This commission decided to classify the exhibits of the fair into seven departments, agriculture, art, education and science, horticulture, machinery, manufacturers, and mining. Of all the European countries that were invited to participate in the 1876 exposition, as written by newspaper publisher John W. Forney, none of these countries declined. The Centennial Exposition had a specific group of guardsmen hired from soldiers and the local police force, numbering at over 500 men, who were trained and lived on site throughout the time of the fair. These guards were in charge of policing the exhibits, keeping the general peace, reuniting lost children with their families, and the guards received, recorded, and when possible, returned lost items throughout their time on the grounds. Eight guards were said to have passed away while working at this exposition. A specific bank was created solely for handling the entirety of the finances of the fair, from exchanging foreign funds to selling and collecting the ticket revenue to providing the payment to the numerous businesses and pavilions that were in operation, this bank was chartered as the Centennial National Bank on January 19, 1876. We're told the Centennial Commission mentioned earlier, who operated in unison with the Centennial National Bank, completely ran out of funds by the time of printing tickets for the expo and printing the other promotional items for the fair. To quell this issue, we're told the city of Philadelphia then appropriated over $50,000 to the bank, which was able to continue operation long after the 1876 exposition ended. The Centennial National Bank of Philadelphia was the only national bank in West Philadelphia from 1876 onward and remained the sole national bank in that part of the city well into the mid-1900s. We're told the majority of the fairgrounds were designed by Herman J. Schwartzman, a lead engineer for the Fairmount Park Commission. In 1869, Schwartzman had begun working for the Fairmount Park Commission, which administered the site of the 1876 Centennial Expo. Schwartzman was the chief architect for the Centennial Exposition, designing Memorial Hall, Horticulture Hall, dozens of other smaller buildings, and the landscaping around the entire fairgrounds. Today, Fairmount Park is considered one of the greatest urban parks in all of America, with an unbreakable importance that's tied to landscaping history. There were five main buildings on the grounds, including the main exhibition building, Memorial Hall, Machinery Hall, Agriculture Hall, and Horticulture Hall. Apart from these buildings, there were also separate buildings for state, federal, foreign, corporate, and public comfort buildings, numbering over 200 unique structures in total. The main exhibition hall was to be built based off a design competition with 10 finalists being selected. However, we're told in this narrative by the year 1873, all 10 of these designs were considered to be too complex and all 10 of the plans were abandoned for a simpler neo-Gothic one. In terms of total area enclosed, 21 and a half acres, the main exhibition hall was the largest building in the world at that time. The structure of the building featured a central avenue with a series of parallel sheds that were 120 feet wide, over 1,800 feet long, and 75 feet tall. It was the largest nave ever introduced into an exhibition building up to that time period. After the exposition, 
this structure was turned into a permanent building for the international exhibition. During the auction that was held for the building on December the 1st, 1876, it was bought for over $250,000. It quickly ran into financial difficulties, but remained open through 1879. However, it was finally completely demolished in 1881. The 1876 exposition also included the Women's Pavilion, the first structure at an international exposition to highlight the work of women with exhibits created and operated solely by women. Their aim was to employ only women in the construction of the pavilion and even to power it, and they succeeded in this goal with the exception of the main fair designer Schwartzman, who had a small say in the overall landscaping design. 26 of the 37 U.S. states at the time constructed buildings along State's Drive in the exhibition grounds. Of these 26, three of these formerly temporary buildings still stand today. Remarkably, of these three still standing, only one still stands in Philadelphia, the Ohio House, with the Maryland House being relocated and made permanent in Baltimore, Maryland, where it still exists today, as well as the Missouri House, which was moved to Spring Lake, New Jersey, where it also still stands today. The informal name of the fair was the International Exhibition of Arts, Manufacturers, and Products of the Soil and Mine. But the official theme was the celebration of each of the United States throughout the centennial. The official number of first-day attendees alone was over 180,000 people, with a whopping 110,000 entering with free passes, including United States President Ulysses S. Grant. The highest attendance day of the entire exposition was September the 28th. That day, which saw about a quarter of a million attend, was Pennsylvania Day and included famous speeches, receptions, and foreign-created fireworks. The final month of the exposition, November, held an average daily attendance of 115,000 people. By the time the exposition ended on November the 10th, a total of 10 million or more had visited the fair, including Woodrow Wilson, who would later go on to become the American president. Although not financially successful for the commissioners and the investors involved, with many said to go bankrupt following the fair, the Centennial Exposition impressed the visitors, depicting the industrial and commercial growth of the country. The level of American exports increased, the level of imports decreased, and the trade balance grew in favor of the United States following the 1876 Exposition in Philadelphia. As far as the numerous inventions, technology, and tech that was showcased at the 1876 Centennial Exposition, these included the inventions of the steam-powered elevated Centennial monorail. We also have the first world showcase of a sewing machine, as well as the first display of a typewriter, both of which would go on to pioneer their respective fields. Also showcased for the first or near first time to the public at the 1876 fair in Philadelphia included new types of stoves, lanterns, weaponry, steam and standard carriages, and agricultural equipment and other farming advancements which were revolutionizing the industrial age. At the 1876 fair, the public was introduced to Alexander Graham Bell's telephone, Thomas Edison's automatic telegraph system, a screw cutting machine, which improved daily production from 8,000 bolts to over 100,000 bolts, and the universal grinding machine that was produced by Brown and Sharp. We also have the introduction of the first air powered tools, the first mechanical calculator created by George Grant, the first electric lights, a precursor known as the Wallace Farmer Electric Dynamo, and the public was also introduced for the first time to the now standard foods of popcorn, root beer, and Heinz tomato ketchup. The right arm and torch of the Statue of Liberty were showcased at the 1876 exposition, where fairgoers could pay 50 cents to climb to the top of the torch. With all the money, all the proceeds raised, 
going towards paying for completion of the Grand Statue of Liberty in New York City. Throughout the many thousands of inspirational aspects of the 1876 Centennial Exposition and of the over 100 unique structures and creations that we've looked at in today's video, I'd love to hear which aspect of this narrative or these photographs have stood out to you the most. I can't wait to hear your opinion in the comment section down below, and I thank you all so much for taking the time to dive into the 1876 World's Fair in Philadelphia with me today. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like. Please consider sharing this video, as that truly is the best way to get these photographs out there, to get this information out there, to show people there is more to our not so distant past that we can still learn about. And if you're not already, please consider subscribing to the channel because just about every week, I'm putting out numerous videos just like this one, where we look at the oldest photographs, we look at some rare and detailed images, and we get into some aspects of history that are more anomalous. So if you enjoy that sort of thing, please consider subscribing to my channel, and I look forward to seeing you on the next video.